Welcome to everyone. Delighted to be able to once again come together with you around works of beauty and to also host the conversation with the artist Ipek Kotan and a dear friend, Robert Mowry, whose credentials are longer than I'm about to present, but was at Harvard for so many years and created an extraordinary collection primarily of Chinese and Korean works uh, with some emphasis on ceramics. But I'm especially appreciative to Bob for his willingness to share in this conversation. And I've emphasized that both to Bob and to EPEC that these are opportunities, I think, to share both information, but also enthusiasms and responses to rather wonderful works of art. The present exhibition of Epex works is called In Search of the Perfect. And I wanted to begin with a quote uh, from Brother Thomas, which is usually my want, uh, which is consciousness of the beautiful will save the world. So the notion of having the privilege of the gallery as a resource for many people to access that notion that beauty itself can inform, if not save the world, and make our lives much more meaningful and much more wonderful. Those of you that eventually will get the visual tour of the gallery and um, the e-catalog of it, of the collections will have a sense of, at least for me, this gallery is now filled with enormous joy. Um, the combination of Epex work with Jerry Garstein who was a painter we represented until he passed in 1994. And to realize that art sometimes endures, in this case, in a very positive way. So it's a very, very exciting moment to be together with you and to have this conversation. So to begin, I think we can start with the cover of the announcement, In Search of the Perfect, and invite any of you and all of you to be part of this conversation as we move along. Next slide, please. Epec, do you wanna talk just a little bit about you at work and how you got to this work? Um, ceramics in general? Um, let's see. The ceramics in general actually came out of um, a pretty, um, deep depression. I was um, working in at in Istanbul at a um, real estate investment company and my job was marketing and mainly communication and it felt it, it was a good job it you know it, everything looked perfect on paper actually. I was making a decent living you know you know had nice office mates you know a great boss and nice home. I made a decent living but there was something, I, there was this nagging feeling inside me that something was off. And I felt over the years, I became more and more depressed and, and literally I was wasting away. I actually, you know, what started first as bulimia, it turned eventually into anorexia and I weighed something like 90 something pounds. And I realized at some point, you know, something needs to change. And I was working a lot, so I realized it's it's not, you know, I, I love working, I love being productive, doing something with my life, but what I was doing wasn't really working. So I made a list of moments that made me happy, thinking if I can find the common denominator in these moments, you know, throughout my life, then I could perhaps find a job, you know, find a, an occupation that had more of these moments so that even if I, you know, worked a lot, um, I would simply have more happy moments or, you know, peaceful moments. and by the end of my life, I'd be able to look back and say, okay, you know, I was actually mainly happy. So, so this list I made over, I think three, four weeks and it was very random. Um, things like, you know, touching my dog's ear and feeling the peach fuzz um, on her ears or cutting a tomato with a sharp knife or picking nail polish or looking at a beautiful sunset or from when I was a kid, you know, making a sand castle in the sand and just, a lot of these moments had basically being in the moment, feeling things, thinking about colors, shapes, forms, textures. Um, there was a lot of touching, shaping, um, and feeling. And, and then I realized, wait a minute, this is, this is all being creative and like feeling things and touching, shaping, thinking about these things. So it sounds like it would be, you know, art and design. And 
then I started to ask myself, well, okay, do I want to be selling art or do I want to be a curator? Do I want to go back to school? And after all these, a lot of, you know, soul searching and asking myself a lot of questions, I realized I wanted to work with, um, I wanted to go back to school. I wanted to actually study something that I really wanted to study, um, which was art and design. Uh, and then there were, of course, a lot of materials to choose from. So I realized I wanted to stop st um, study and work with something at, uh, that was a natural material. So it brought me to glass, metal, um, wood, and clay. And then I chose, um, I quit my job around that time and decided to sign up for summer school, a six week summer school at RISD and sign up for metal smithing and ceramics. And ceramics was, you know, it just took me to another universe. And I found peace and, and, and love and joy. And I remember the moments when I actually felt like, okay, this is it for me. Um, when it was a Wednesday night and everybody was out, you know, drinking with their friends, it was summer. And I was still in the studio that night at 10 o'clock, even though I didn't even have a lesson that day. And I was still throwing on the wheel the whole day and evening. And then this, this, this amazing feeling of calm washed over me and I felt so peaceful. <laughs> and then I felt like this is it. This is, this is what I've been waiting for, looking for my whole life. It just felt so right. I could feel it in every cell and I started crying and it, it just felt really cathartic. And it was like this, moment where I felt like my my heart body and soul finally aligns you know with what I was doing and it just felt like this is it you know I, I don't have to choose or look for it anymore it chose me ceramics chose me that's rather lovely I just wanted to let you know that I had marked one other quote from brother Thomas which I was going to introduce much later but it seems now is the time the routine of life holds us in the readiness for the events of the soul and certainly what you just described was the moment for you when there was an epiphany for yourself, spiritually, personally, and emotionally, to engage with clay and then to invest yourself totally in it because it gave you so much back, which is really quite a wonderful time and space to have found yourself in. Yeah, yeah. Bob, you, for the most part, dealt with not many artists that were living, but here's an opportunity to sort of respond to the journey of a living artist and just some of your thoughts about what Epec just shared with us. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, yes, uh, thank you, Bernie. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm a specialist in East Asian art, particularly Chinese and Korean, uh, with a, a real focus on ceramics from those two cultures. And over the course of my career, I've handled literally hundreds of thousands of ceramics uh, in from the very finest in the Palace Museum in Beijing, Palace Museum in Taipei, uh, to the mundane, to works uh, that have been recovered in archaeological digs that are wonderful but perhaps broken and dealing with shards that are encrusted with dirt. So I have in, uh, covered the entire uh, range. Uh, but looking at uh, EPEX ceramics, uh, they're extraordinary. Not only they're, are they beautiful, but they are uh, technically accomplished at such a high level. Uh, they are absolute perfection. And some of the things that I would note uh, with my background, particularly in Chinese ceramics and thinking about uh, Chinese imperial porcelains, uh, <clears throat> in most cases with Chinese ceramics and probably uh, most of the places around the world where potters glaze their ceramics, for the most part, they completely cover the underlying body. Uh, whether it's a stoneware body or, in this case, a porcelain body. Of course, one sees uh, the exposed body perhaps at the, uh, at the foot ring, and one senses the body uh, looking through the glaze in those areas where the glaze is thin. But uh, EPEC uh, has perfected uh, the white body not only as the, the uh, structure for the ceramic Piece, but one perceives the porcelain itself as part of the overall experience. So in many cases, the interior, or in so many of the pieces, the interior is glazed, uh, but the exterior is left unglazed and then burnished uh, so that it's uh, so very uh, soft uh, to the touch. So this is uh, somewhat revolutionary uh, to glaze the interior of the pot. 
uh, but to leave the exterior uh, unglazed, but then finish uh, the unglazed part uh, so, uh, so beautifully. Uh, and then uh, another thing is that the, the walls uh, of Epex pots are often very thick, uh, as we see uh, in the slide at the moment. And in a sense, because the wall is so thick, uh, it adds another dimension. In later Chinese ceramics, in Ming or Qing porcelain, of course, the goal was always to create a very thin body. Uh, but in this case, uh, the uh, epex, uh, the the walls of epex pots are quite thick, and in a sense, because the interior was glazed, the top of the rim is not, nor is the exterior. To some extent, uh, the unglazed rim acts as a frame uh, to showcase the beautiful glaze within. So these are things that, uh, while it's porcelain, in that sense, it's a relative of the very finest Chinese porcelain and things like that. Uh, that is, the material uh, is closely related, uh, but the interpretation is quite uh, different. And to see uh, the goals uh, that I look for in the very best Chinese ceramics, thin walls, fully glazed, to have that turned inside out, uh, as it were, with Epex ceramics, uh, first of all, uh, it was uh, a surprise to see that. Uh, but as I looked at them, I realized what a happy surprise to explore something new, to do it completely differently. And so those would be my initial aesthetic uh, reactions to Epex pots, uh, the beautiful white porcelain buffed uh, to a very smooth surface, the extraordinarily beautiful glaze, and the absolute technical and aesthetic perfection of the pieces. Thanks, Bob, because I think that helps us when we get further into it and begin looking at and appreciating the works that she has created. And the next slide, which is a short video <laughs> of your uh, new studio. You, pick, um, you, I would think, have moved a few times and might want to talk about your journey physically from place to place in order to find the place for you to work and feel uh, satisfied. Nice. It looks like a rather large space. There is actually, it's um, 114 square meters. Um, so I think that's a little, a little bit over 1100 square feet. It's, it's a pretty big studio, but I've noticed that um, over the years, it's um, having actually more space is a good thing when you're trying to work with large pieces especially with porcelain, mainly because um, the piece of the, the bigger um, porcelain, shrink, well, let me start with this. Porcelain shrinks 20%, at least the porcelain that I use, Audrey Blackman at the moment. Um, so 20% is huge and you have to, so that means if you want to have a piece this big, you actually have to make it this big because it shrinks a ton, a lot, 20%. Um, one, there's that. And also you always have to make the piece a little bit bigger so that the way I work is, it's a little bit like sculpting. First, I give a very general shape to the piece. It's very coarse, you know, you actually don't even see. You can, you can look at it, you can see the general shape, but it actually needs to be, a lot needs to be removed. So if it takes me, for example, to make a piece 20 minutes, I may spend hours uh, trimming it with various tools. Uh, one is a sure farm, like a cheese grater tool, really like a Parmesan grater. And you, you grate first the, you know, main, a, a lot of the clay with that, and then, I use um, a metal rib to actually shave off parts. So it's, it's actually very similar to the way um, a sculptor might work with um, a piece of wood or you know, rock. You know, first there's a you know, very crude shape and then little by little, you refine it more and more and more. And so that means it has to be actually really much bigger than what you see. And the other thing is the pieces need to dry for literally months. If they don't, they crack. Um, that means if, you know, if, for example, for a show like this, if I want to have 10 big pieces, I really have to make at least 50 to, you know, 100, but really more like 50 so that I can actually uh, factor the cracking so that I can, you know, I can make sure even with the cracking, have enough pieces. Well, that means there has to be basically a room just for drying the pieces uh, because they, I put basically a box over the clear box over the pieces when they're drying so I can, uh, there's also a hygrometer which measures the, the moisture on the inside of the box and the pieces dry little by little over months. So 
I mean, simply that uh, means I need a lot of space so that I have um, enough room to dry the pieces and, and keep making other pieces in the meantime um, and also teach. So um, yeah, I need a lot of space. So, so where have you set up your studios over the past 20 years? Oh, um, so my first studio, I mean, I, well, I started at RISD uh, in Providence, uh, you know, the, the common studio that we used in school. Then I did my master's in the UK um, in the heart of the potteries there uh, at Staffordshire University, which is um, just next door to um, Royal Dalton and Wedgwood, you know, it's, so it's where the, they would actually um, train people to go into the industry. And that my second studio was there. And then, um, then I moved to London shortly. I had a, you know, no, I was working for an artist there and I you know, was able to use his studio when I had free time. Then I moved to Austria, um, then to Switzerland, Geneva and Neuchâtel, um, and then to Oysterwijk, uh, where there is European Ceramic Work Center, a quite famous um, ceramic residency in the Netherlands, where mainly people who don't work with clay come and work with clay, experiment with clay. Um, I've been there three times. One of them was actually for a year. Um, it stopped the clay convent. It's a very interesting place. It's, you know, they give you a tiny room. It looks like a convent, you know, with very basic amenities, but they give you a huge studio. Um, and there is not much to do in the town. So you just end up working a lot. Um, so that's very immersive experience. And from there, I moved to Amsterdam where my studio was in my living room. Um, and then I moved to Leiden. And in the same building, actually, in the last four years, I moved to three different studios, starting with a smaller one, then a bigger and a bigger. <laughs> but the photographer who just um, did the last photo shoot part, he actually asked me, so your plan is to what, take over the whole building? Because every time he comes to shoot, it's a different, a bigger studio. <laughs> but I think I'm okay where I am now <laughs> for a while. It's fantastic. Can we look at some of the work now, Caroline? That's wonderful. So Bob, would you like to just talk briefly about this particular piece as we start? Okay, <clears throat> again, looking at this piece and uh, the others that will follow, uh, the question I would, uh, or the, the uh, uh, idea that I would like to explore with EPEC here is that when we think of porcelain, uh, of course we think of a white uh, body, uh, usually, and presumably in your case, uh, composed of the two basic porcelain clays, the kaolin and the patoons. Uh, now that yields a white uh, body as we see here. Could we go to the next slide, please? But you also have so-called black uh, porcelain, as we see in the exposed body uh, of this piece. Now, because it's porcelain, I presume it's still the same basic two porcelain clays, uh, kaolin and patoons, uh, to which you must have added a coloring agent uh, so that it's still at its heart white porcelain through and through. No, I mean, it's white porcelain, but you have added a coloring agent so it's black uh, through and through but it's still porcelain. Could you tell us about um, uh, how you decided to use uh, uh, black porcelain? Uh, I know some other potters who do that, but it's relatively rare because we usually see the white porcelain. And uh, tell us your thoughts about black porcelain, how you color it black, and um, uh, the aesthetics as you see it behind such pieces. Uh, and the, how you view the differences between black and white uh, pieces. Do you use the same glazes, different glazes, some overlap, those kinds of questions about relationship in your mind between black and white porcelain? Sure, sure. Um, so um, I started working with porcelain in I think 2008 and absolutely fell in love with it, the, you know, the first time. It was love at first, you know, first touch. It's just an extremely sensual and beautiful material, really fine, really sensitive. And, and also it's, it's, um, uh, it's, it's actually less forgiving, more capricious. And a friend, as a friend of mine likes to call it, it's a diva material that really tests your love for it at all times. It wants to, it wants to crack, it wants to flop, it wants to collapse. It, you know, it just, it, it's a very finicky material, which, which means you have to be really present at all times, which I think was really actually helpful. What I um, forgot to mention before was, um, even though I struggled with, um, 
eating disorders for 17 years and depression, once I found ceramics, once I found my calling, my true calling, um, it gave me the strength to actually heal. Within, I think, two, you know, once I realized, okay, I love, I love this so much, I can't afford to be weak, not get out of bed in the morning. I can't afford to not have energy because I found something I really love and I was 30 at the time, which meant I don't have that much time to, you know, I have less time than my peers to go into it. So I have to do this really fast. So that gave me the strength to actually really find a way to heal. And by, and I, after 17 years of, you know, struggling with this, within, within a year of starting working with clay, I healed completely. So it was, it was the love of this material that, you know, gave me a second lease in life. And it was the, the beauty of the material that also made me want to hang on to it. So with porcelain, a lot of potters or a lot of artists like the translucency, for me, it was actually the touch. It was such a beautiful, incredible feeling. And it was so healing for me to, to, to basically love something um, so much that, that, I, you know, that I wanted to get better. So for me, it wasn't the translucency that got me hooked, but it was the feeling of it. So that's also why I like to um, leave the outside uh, footless. Actually, that's also one thing that I, you know, that I do differently than most other potters. I don't care for a foot ring because I think it takes away from the flawlessness. If you pick up, I mean, I always encourage people to pick up my work. I say, pick it up, touch it, feel the weight, feel the balance, you know, you know, touch the rim, touch the back, you know, the bottom part and, you know, feel the weight. I like them to be robust. I like them to be strong. They're not so fragile. Um, and they're also friendlier. So instead of trans, uh, well, if you're not interested in translucency in porcelain, but you're more interested in texture, then I think the whole like leaving the outside is just, it really lends itself to that. So when a lot of times when people see my work, even from pictures, they say, it just invites me to touch it. And that's exactly what I want to achieve with the work. They're as much made to be touched and, and petted and caressed as to be looked at. Um, and since I don't care for translucency, um, that, you know, then it's just, it's, uh, the black was actually the natural next step for me after working with the white, because I felt like I've been working with, um, um, members of the same family, you know, my work has been, you know, has, has a very, very distinct look, um, uh, but I, it felt like this year, one, it was the biggest show on my, you know, career yet, 50 pieces. And two, I felt like, okay, it's been, you know, 12 years of working with the white porcelain, with this form. Now, not only do I want to, you know, um, explore different forms, you know, branch out a little bit and play around, be more playful, as opposed to, and also risk, basically, you know, risk imperfection or risk um, failures. Because with porcelain, so many things can go wrong. It's, that's why a lot of potters tend to, tend to find something that works for them and then um, explore small variations little by little because every time you change something you're risking cracking you're risking something going wrong whether it's the glaze or the clay body not make um, being a good fit with the glaze um, so this time um, when Bernie challenged me to make well how about 50 pieces instead of 25 I thought okay you know what let's do it and not only that but you know this will actually be a good thing for me because it'll give me um, room for room for um, improvement, playfulness, experimentation, and also failure. 50 men, even if, even if a lot of them crack and don't make it, I'll still end up with hopefully 25 really good pieces. And the black porcelain just came out of that. I worked with um, a darker stoneware earlier in 2010, 12, but it wasn't quite as fine. And when I saw that there was a porcelain available that was black, um, I was like, yeah, okay, <laughs> let me try this. And that was definitely challenging because a lot of my glazes didn't work well. Whenever, you know, when it's, uh, so it's actually through and through. Um, I don't make the, the, I don't add it in. I actually buy the clay black, um, the, the porcelain black, as it's made that way. But what I do is um, I put a white liner and underglaze on the inside of the pieces so that the, the glazes don't get eaten up by the, the darkness so that there's still a nice contrast between the outside, but it's inverted. This time the inside is colorful and the outside is dark. So there's still a contrast, but um, it's a little bit different. And I'd like to say just, you know, one thing about um, the, the, you know, inside out thing. I, I always feel like pots, they're quite similar, like people, they look, you know, they, you know very similar um, to each other, but you only, you only get to see the differences when you get up close and personal. And people are like that too. I'm 
very much a people person. I love getting to know people and, you know, oh, that's 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 what makes tick, sorry. No, there was an echo, I think. Let me just ask between um, Carolyn, if you don't mind going back to the previous slide as well, talking simply not about the, exactly, thank you, not about the difference of between black and white porcelain and how you ended up there. And I'm very appreciative of the fact that you were willing to expand your vocabulary in terms of forms, but to talk about these two forms, one where you have the rounded lip coming and defining the interior, but all in white, and the other with the three levels essentially defined on the outside of the black and then the inside, which is not as typical of the work that we originally received from you, but it adds a dimension of absolute uh, difference. And then having a show means that people can actually go from piece to piece, pick up pieces and feel and see the differences. So if you talk about the differences in the forms themselves from your perspective, yeah, um, in between these two forms, you mean with this one and the other one? Yeah. Yes. Um, the that form actually came out of um, it's simply um, I, when I when after I dry the pieces and they're bisque fired and sanded, I tend to stack them simply to save space on the shelves. You know, I you know it's it would be not um, economical space wise to you know have um, have the pieces not stacking. So sometimes I just look at all these pieces that are stacked of similar sizes, and I'm like, oh. Oh, that actually would make a nice form. <laughs> so the one that you're seeing uh, with the black porcelain simply came out of that, you know, because I would just once in a while look at the shop and like, that's actually a nice form, you know, why didn't I do that? So that's that's how that you know that's where it came from. And people ask me, you know, if why I don't um, why don't I don't do slip casting because my forms look like they work well with slip casting, but in fact. I did two years of slip casting when I did the ceramic design program because it was very industrial. I wasn't even allowed to throw. Um, but with um, with working with molds or slip casting, the the form, the thickness of the wall has to be absolutely even, simply by the nature of the process. I, I whereas I'm really interested in one flawlessness because if you do um, slip casting, you have to have a seam line, which I would hate. <laughs> and two, you would you, I would have to have you know. Uh, I would be forced to be okay with um, the same thickness across, you know, the, uh, the, the cross section. Whereas I really enjoy um, difference, you know, it's a little bit thicker, thinner here, then it gets a little bit thicker. It's really thicker here. And there's actually, even here, there's a little dip, so it never wobbles. And then there's a little bit of this so that the bottom is always a little bit like that, uh, allowing the glaze to pull and creating that, um, that thing uh, when, when the glaze pulls, the glaze thickness um, determines the, the texture really. So when I do a little bit of you know curve like this, as opposed to coming down and being flat, that allows the glaze to do something really cool. So with slip casting, I'd never be able to do that, but that's basically you know the main difference between these. It's um, the black one is almost like three pieces stacked on top of each other. Right, Bob, would you respond to the same question from your perspective as a curator looking at these? three forms, the first one, the white sides coming in on it, and then the next slide, um, Carolyn, that we can look at as well, um, the ripples, essentially, the three layers that uh, Epec talked about. Yes, they're wonderful forms. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the, excuse me, the, excuse me, uh, the unglazed exterior, whether it's black or whether it's white, uh, really acts as something of a frame to showcase uh, the beautiful glaze uh, within. Uh, but uh, yeah, slip casting would, uh, it, it's a very uh, efficient way to produce uh, tableware uh, for everyday use and things like that. But uh, slip casting is not uh, really appropriate for producing, uh, for the most part, uh, producing works of art uh, like the fine uh, porcelains uh, that uh, EPEC uh, has created and uh, uh, is uh, and is exhibiting here. Uh, and I think that uh, it is wonderful to have the thick walls uh, more evident in the previous slide. Caroline, if you want to go back one slide. Yeah, yes, uh, the thick wall that you see here, um, uh, it showcases the beautiful unglazed, uh, highly buffed, and I say buffed as opposed to polished. One could use polished, but polish often uh, implies that there's a luster. 
uh, these, this is a matte finish, and so perhaps buff uh, is a better word. But when you touch them, uh, they are absolutely smooth, inviting to the touch, uh, and one sort of feels that one is touching satin uh, as opposed to unglazed ceramic ware. Uh, but uh, going back to the ceramic body, uh, the porcelain body, uh, two quick questions uh, for uh, EPAC. Um, you mentioned that you buy uh, the uh, porcelain clay uh, and you buy the white clay, you buy the, uh, the black clay, so it's already prepared and ready to go. Have you ever experimented with preparing your own porcelain clay, starting with KLM patoons, uh, purifying them, mixing them together to get the right uh, mixture. Uh, I know you don't produce your pots that way, but I just wonder if you've experimented with that. Um, and number two, even with the clay that you purchased, do you have to do much purification or a lot of working to uh, make sure that there are no air bubbles in the clay and things okay. like that, uh, which certainly uh, would cause all kinds of distortions and... Uh, 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 warts and whatever you want to call it uh, that would occur uh, if you uh, didn't work out the air bubbles before firing. So those two questions about the clay. Oh dear, Epex disappeared. I asked the wrong questions. No, no. Oh, really? well, <laughs> Some technical uh, issue. Yeah, on her end. So let's um, move well, on. To While we're waiting the, for uh, yeah. uh, EPEC to come back, I would just say some of the things that I was interested in, um, uh, this kind of uh, 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 brown glaze with a metallic sheen uh, relates to wares used in Chinese brown and black glazed wares uh, uh, called, often referred to by the Japanese name temmoku, uh, which uh, is a traditional colorant, a glazed colorant. Uh, uh, coming from iron. Move on to the next one, please, Carolyn. Hi. And in using oh, sorry, iron, sorry you can, uh, we'll come as soon as I finish this, we'll go right back to you, Epex, so you can uh, uh, respond. Uh, but I was just trying to do something while you were away for a second. Uh, the, when you use iron, uh, there are a couple of different uh, uh, compounds of iron. Uh, there's uh, Fe304, Fe203, uh, using different uh, oxides of iron, even though it's still iron, different oxides of iron produce slightly different results, and also the quantity uh, of the iron oxide added to the glaze. So even with the same colorant uh, that is an oxide of iron, such as this one or the previous one, you can get a brown or black glaze with very different uh, surface effects uh, to the glaze. Now, um, uh, back to EPEC, uh, to uh, continue what we were discussing before. Yeah, sorry about that um, technical issue. Um, so I, that is actually making my own porcelain will be absolutely the next step. I've already started um, modifying my, uh, my porcelain. Sometimes I work with stoneware also modifying that, mainly because with large pieces of survival rates, uh, meaning no crack rate is actually one to two in 10. I mean, that's, that's such, if you think about the amount of time and energy I have to spend on the pieces, um, it's, it's such a waste of time and energy to not actually, you know, really go after this to try to fix the cracking issue. Um, and to do that, I've, I've, I've tried, you know, switching from porcelain to stoneware. I've also tried working with a mix of porcelain and stoneware. Um, and then I've started, um, I've experimented with adding molochite. Molochite is simply um, porcelain uh, fired up to top temperature and then um, ground up uh, to, to become like flour. And then you can add that to the porcelain body uh, when you make a slip. Slip is basically liquid clay. So I've, I've actually done that with different um, percentages. Try 20%, 30%, 40% of molochite. Um, but that unfortunately changes the, the openness of the, the clay body. So it's, the, the glazes stop working as well. So that, that would mean um, if I add a lot of molochite, I have to then um, start creating a whole other set of glazes. And I'm trying to find a way not to do that. So, um, but I think eventually I will actually make my own clay. It's a lot of, um, I've talked to a lot of experts. They seem to tell me, um, they, they seem to all be telling me that I would actually have a better rate of survival for the big pieces um, if I made my own clay so that it's, um, it's basically formulated to do exactly what I needed to do, which is survive high temperature firing, 
and in um, large format. Um, yeah, so I don't at the moment make my own porcelain um, because, simply because it would take a lot of time and I'm not really an expert in this. So I keep, you know, I continue to work with Audrey Blackman porcelain, but mm -hmm. I think that's the next step really. Yeah. So let's move on to these two. Uh, no, no, not that far. Back to the two uh, Temoku pieces that Bob began speaking about. And just briefly to, from your perspective, to talk about what you feel are the elements of both of them that meant that you didn't break them and they didn't break. Um, could, you, uh, could you say that again, please, uh, these two pieces? I didn't really have a question about these two pieces when I was speaking. My point was simply moving from the body to talk a little bit about the glazes, is that <laughs> some of EPAC's glazes recall uh, classic glazes, particularly classic glazes in China, uh, such as the brown or black glaze that we see here, uh, that is often uh, uh, goes by the Japanese name temmoku uh, or hare's fur. It's simply a uh, a, uh, a a glaze that it's related to a celadon glaze because celadon is also uh, uses iron oxide as a colorant, but increasing the amount of iron oxide in the glaze, uh, it shifts from uh, a pale bluish green celadon to a brown uh, or black glaze, uh, as we're seeing here. And then the markings on the surface, at least in traditional Chinese uh, ceramics in uh, uh, Chinese teawares from the Song Dynasty, the markings on the surface result either from the application of a little bit of slip, iron bearing slip on the surface, or uh, from uh, uh, saturation of the glaze with the coloring agent, such that it segregates itself out, uh, the coloring agent segregates itself out on the surface during the cooling process. Uh, the next slide, please, Carolyn. There. Uh, uh, I don't know exactly how EPEC produced this, but in uh, in a Chinese tamok bowl, bowl, this would have resulted from uh, saturating the glaze with the iron oxide coloring agent such that the glaze can't hold any more of the iron oxide and it uh, segregates itself out and uh, uh, forms the beautiful uh, silvery metallic uh, sheen on the surface. Uh, now, OPEC, uh, EPEC may have produced it a different way, uh, but uh, that's the way the Chinese would have done that in the Song Dynasty. Uh, EPEC, do you want to talk about the two pieces? Uh, yeah, it's um. So this this glaze, I actually started to work with in two thousand eight, and similar to you know the love at first touch, it was this was definitely love at first sight. Um, it I the, the the you know I even remember the particular piece, like the first piece that came out of him with this glaze. Um, it's a high metallic glaze. Um, it's it's got a lot of manganese in it, and I just remember looking at this piece, thinking, oh my. God, this is incredible. Uh, it was, you know, it had these tiny, teeny little, you know, like silvery crystals and this silky matte, you know, brown. Like it was just like, this gorgeous color, but also texture. It was silky smooth, and the crystals were slightly shiny, and they were they looked like tiny, teeny little stars that someone just sprinkled inside. And so I fell in love with this glaze, and I started working with it in two thousand eight, and I'm still in love with it. Um, so I have a lot of variations of it. Over the years, I think I made over 45 variations of this glaze. And sometimes it's, the little variations are as little as uh, simply changing the, you know, taking the, using the same formula, but um, the same ingredients, but changing the proportions just to experiment. Um, and sometimes it's actually buying the same materials, you know, for example, manganese or iron, uh, but from different mines, different suppliers that come from different countries even that can actually change the, um, the outcome. So I have a lot of different um, bronze glazes simply because the proportions of the material of the glaze is different, what the ingredients, and also the same material. For example, a few years ago, I had this awful problem with this glaze where I wasn't getting the crystals. I mean, I had moved also from Switzerland to, to the Netherlands and I thought, oh, maybe it's the water because you know you can change little things in an ingredient and it will create different results. So I thought maybe the water is harder here, more calcium, less calcium, but I was going crazy. I just couldn't get the crystals to work anymore. And then I ran out of um, one of the ingredients, copper in this glaze. 
and then I had to order a new one. And when I ordered the, you know, the, the when the new delivery arrived, it just looked like um the copper looked like a different green, but it sold under the same name, copper carbonate. So then I asked the company, I and I sent the the batch number of the old, and I said, are you sure there is not a mistake here? Because for three years I've been using this lighter green one. I said, no, no, they're both copper carbonate, but it's just slightly different. It should work the same way. And it, it was just mind blown. I realized simply because it came from a different supplier, different mine, it actually, even though it's the same or molecular, you know, it's the same material, it actually acts differently. And I knew this, that's why I was always playing around with getting, you know, red clay for a glaze from, you know, I don't know, Westerwald in Germany or UK or um, different kinds of manganese from different countries. But that really made me understand, this is insane. If you like a glaze, you have to buy a lot of the material so that they last you a lifetime. Um, and I just love this glaze. It's um, the, because these two pieces are very similar in glaze formula. They're, they're actually you know, fired in the same way, but they produce very different crystals. And it's, it's just lovely. It's, it's like having a... Um, it's like having a conversation with um, the same person, but at different times. And then, you, you know, you, you find out something different because the glaze formula is very similar. The firing is the same, but you just get different results and it's lovely. It is indeed. And for people who are able to visit the gallery, the opportunity both to look at them and to hold them. Also, the realization that there are they are very different visual and personal experiences. Let's yeah. move to the next image if we could. Because here from the chemical in the dark, you have this rack, very beautiful crystalline glaze with the crackles in it. And there's a sense of visual purity to this um, in these two pieces. And also the shape itself has a kind of delicacy. The walls don't seem to be as thick. The lip around it is more open. There's a sort of generosity and invitation to simply become part of it. I love that you say generosity, actually, because um, when when I was trying, when I was figuring, when I was still in school, you know, studying art and deciding to, you know, um, trying to decide what shape or what form, what object I should focus on, um, I realized a lot of the artists, you know, I really loved um, Rothko or um, Pierre Soulage or just different artists, you know, or Agnes Martin, you know, huge fan, Martin Klein. Um, I, I really, I, I, um, I, what I really liked, um, or Andy Goldsworthy, you know, Georgia O'Keeffe, these are all, or Chuck Close, uh, I can't, <laughs> I'll stop. Uh, these are all the artists who, who've given, you know, decades of their career to something similar, exploring freedom and restriction. And that's something I can relate to. I also find, you know, like them, freedom and restriction. So I, I wanted to, when I was first starting out, um, commit myself to one material, clay and also commit myself to, to a form or an object that would be meaningful to me because I think art is searching for a meaning or trying to find meaning or express meaning and so I thought okay well I want to be like these artists like I admire so much people who you know with something with something specific whether it's nature or um, gestural painting or lines and I thought okay what am I going to do and again going back to my childhood and um, my origin I I realized, well, Turkey is absolutely full of, um, if you like sightseeing and historical archaeology, and I love archaeology. Um, I thought, wait a minute, you know, there, there's, this, there's something really um, common in all these different cultures, wherever, wherever you go in the world, if you go to an archaeological site, you'll always find a bowl. And growing up as a child in the 70s and 80s, there, there was a lot of, in Turkey, um, polarization. It was, you know, um, you know, men and women had, had to live by different rules. It's, it, I mean, it was still a, I mean, a back then, a, you know, more secular country than it is now, but um, there were, oh, my brother and I had different rules we had to live by. And there were polarization, you know, you heard, you heard about the Kurdish Turkish problem and um, there was an otherness there, there. You felt it a lot in society. And I didn't like that as a very sensitive kid, you know, I thought everybody should get along and I didn't understand why we had to have wars. And there was also, you know, Pol Pot, you know, just Cambodia, the awful things happening around Iraq. And I thought, okay, well, you know, humanity is, you know, is at the same time beautiful and in tough to each other. But if I, if I want to create meaning, then I need to focus on the good things. And 
the good things were, um, they were good things, they were common things, you know, and the bold, the bold form, I felt like, wow, not only do you fight in a lot of different countries, but also it goes back to 30,000 years. One of the oldest forms, you know, humans made, a form that we still use today. Um, and whether you, you know, whether the ancient Egypt um, put organs um, inside, you know, after someone died to preserve them, or whether we share, you know, um, a drink together, or, you know, something that you offer to someone when they come to visit your house in Turkey, it's, you know, it's, it's very common, you know, when someone comes to visit, you offer them something sweet, but it's always in a bowl. So that shape, but to me was really important. And to the generosity, again, I thought like generosity, preserving, um, safekeeping, these are all really positive aspects of humanness. And so that's why I chose this form. And this particular shape to me is the embodiment of that um, continuity and on the, um, on the positive, Mm, the positive elements of, you know, human DNA, sharing, generosity. So it's, um, yeah, I really like that you saw that in this piece. It's very open. <laughs> Bob, if you'd come in on this and the next piece together or separately. So um, Caroline, let's look at the next one as well and then go back and forth. Um, and I like Bob's, your perspective on the two pieces. Okay, uh, going back to the uh, previous one, Caroline, uh, this one, um, is this a celadon glaze uh, epec uh, colored by iron oxide, or is this a completely different glaze? It's, it's actually not, but I, um, when I first started working, I loved, absolutely loved reduction firing because the alchemy really showed up even more than in oxidation firings. You would put, you know, a material that was just like a like green powder and it would come out ox blood red. Um, that would be from copper. That would be from copper. Yeah, yeah, that would be from copper indeed. Um, but I don't have um so so I love celadon glazes and ox plus, you know, I love the um the ancient glazes, but I I have to work with an electric kiln now, so I, I needed to figure out another way of dealing with it. So so basically I take um a, you know a high nephilim cyanide glaze, which is you know, it has a very nice crackle to it, and simply learn to be okay with adding a stain. A pigment instead of um, iron because the iron would look different if I added it to this. And also, I've tried copper, which because simply because I love working with raw materials, natural materials more than pigments. Um, so I tried copper, but it bubbled a lot. So it's, for some reason, copper um, didn't work with this nephilim high nephilim cyanide glaze. And then, you know, I thought about it. Can I work with a pigment? You know, is it okay? Is it is it cheating? And I just decided to get over myself, and <laughs> work with a pigment. So this is basically um, for me pigment number eight. <laughs> so but, so it um, I try a lot of percentages to figure out the right one, and this one is cobalt. It's it's uh, yeah. This is a very traditional coloring yeah. agent. Uh, we see it in uh, China, Korea, Japan, Europe. Uh, but uh, even though we see it uh, uh, on porcelain, even on earthenware in China in the eighth century, uh, we see cobalt glazes. Uh, <clears throat> and so um, uh, it, it is used in many cultures. Uh, but you have used it so beautifully. It's a very rich, vibrant uh, royal blue, uh, as we see here, and where the glaze is a little bit thicker at the center of the bowl. Uh, where it uh, pools during firing, of course, it appears darker. Uh, but uh, even though uh, cobalt is a glaze coloring agent used uh, around the world, um, uh, you have uh, perfected it in a way that few other cultures have, uh, so that it's just stunningly beautiful. Congratulations. This is one of my favorite pieces. Uh, oh, thank just you. Extraordinarily beautiful uh, with that beauty beautiful blue glaze thank you it's actually a beautiful um purplish blue actually it's it's quite nice because cobalt tends to be very dark like navy blue and i i had to find the right percentage so i experiment a lot um and when i was working with cobalt i went from 0 0.015 percent um to 2.5 and 2.5 gave you almost black and i really wanted this nice blue so i had to find um, a percentage you know somewhere in the middle between those two but yeah, I agree. I think it's a really um, nice, deep, rich, purpley blue. It is. Uh, you've certainly uh, uh, mastered the technique of cobalt. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, the next slide, Caroline. 
There you now, go. Uh, some of the glazes, uh, like the brown glaze uh, with the silvery sheen or cobalt, uh, those use very traditional glaze coloring agents. As I've mentioned, the Chinese have used them for uh, a thousand years. But this is a very different glaze. This is also a high fire glaze, is it? Yeah, yes. it got, uh, this one is 1220, um, I think. Yeah, or 1220, yes. somewhere between that and 1250 because depending on where it is in the kiln, it could change, but yeah, so it's, it's a high this, fire. This was fired during the primary porcelain firing. Uh, uh, yeah, that glaze fire, yeah. Yeah, uh, and so this is quite revolutionary. I mean, many cultures produce uh, a sort of uh, orange red uh, or, or cinnabar red glaze as we see here. But in most cases, when we see this color uh, on a Chinese ceramic, it is an overglaze enamel. Uh, that is applied to the surface of an already fired glazed porcelain and then refired at a lower temperature to uh, mature the enamel, uh, to bring forth its color, and also to fuse it to the glazed surface. Uh, I think this is a very rare uh, glaze color uh, in the family of high fired glazes. And I would be excited to hear you explain something about this glaze because it, to my I, again, I don't work that much with Western ceramics, European or contemporary ceramics, but in my experience, this is quite revolutionary, and I would love to hear you talk about it. Um, well, I hope I won't disappoint, disappoint you when I say this, too, uh, was colored by um, a pigment, and it's because, I, like I said, I do love oxbloods and reds in general, but um, I, because I don't have a gas firing kiln, I have to, you know, reinvent some things and you know find ways to go around issues circumvent problems and limitations and i you know because i work with really generally earthy colors um whether it's you know um bodies of water colors of you know that are related to you know icebergs and rivers and um or or earth like the the bronze ones i once in a while i like to have a little splash of color in a collection or once in a while i like to have something that's a little bit different just it pops and you know, red is a really lovely color. So um, I didn't want it to be um, glossy. So I basically took one of my base glazes, which I like to use to you know to experiment with colors and pigments and and um, raw raw oxides, um, like uh, like uh, raw colors like barium or lithium or spodumene, you know, which create beautiful blues. Or copper is one of my absolute favorite colors because it's so versatile. This one is actually a red pigment, but um, it's on a matte, silky matte base glaze, and I had to fire this, I think, two or three times because the red wasn't, the red was a little bit too, on the too thin side, so I wanted it rich, so I reglazed and refired, reglazed, refired, um, until I actually got this little um, white crystals um, in, you know, when they pulled. So this, this piece is, you know, I think quite lovely, mainly because of the white crystals inside the, the red. It just, it breaks that, um, that uniformity a little bit and creates a little, you know, sparkle there in the middle. Right, that's Wonderful. terrific. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's a it's a new glaze color, if you will, at least in my experience. Uh, the Chinese had perfected the copper red glaze in the, mm -hmm. as yeah. uh, you mentioned, in the so-called oxblood glazes, mm -hmm. uh, which the Chinese say the ideal color in the copper red glazes, from yeah. their perspective, uh, is the color of crushed strawberries, uh, which we would probably say the color of strawberry jam uh, or something like that. Uh, and they perfected that. So, but you have done something different uh, rather than just uh, following what the Chinese did. Uh, this is a, a more orange red glaze uh, instead of a strawberry jam glaze. And I think it's quite new, exciting, uh, and absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Not to mention unique. <laughs> Even better, so it's an opportunity to move on to the next one, which is a blue glaze, and oh. give people a nice option to go from red to blue and back. Right, and here I would just be interested in uh, uh, EPEX. Uh, these are quite different glazes, some of them crystal, and just hear EPEX um, uh, discussion of how she creates them, why she likes them, uh, what's, what she considers special about them. Thank you. Uh, so I, I really, actually, I re this is actually one of my favorite pieces ever and one of my favorite pieces in the show. It's just overall, it's, you know, it's got a very soft shape and then the soft rim, but a sh very sharp rim on the inside. So it, it's, there's something really delicious about it. Um, 
someone saw this piece and said, if Apple made a, if Apple, Apple um, the brand made pots, <laughs> they would look like this. Um, I love that flawlessness um, of this piece and the glaze. I'm looking at the recipe now. So it's also um, uh, felt potash feldspar, um, lithium strontium. So lithium and strontium really help uh, create beautiful blues. I mean, really breathtaking blues. So um, the feldspar creates the, the crackles. And also this one has a little bit of copper in it. Again, one of my absolutely favorite um, colorants because copper, it can, you can get, um, you can get anything from a, a very, very slight you know, green to turquoise to, um, to beige to even black with copper, depending on um, the, the, the reaction in the glaze with the other materials, um, the firing, you know, oxidation or reduction or, um, or the percentage. And this one has ever so slight um, amounts of these colorants. But yeah, I think it's, it's I also think, find it is an absolutely beautiful, almost like a tropical, um, tropical sea um color beautiful. beautiful yep you're absolutely right bob i'm going to move on to the next couple um and get some responses because these manifest differently with the dark outside and the glorious explosion inside yeah this is actually interesting because um it um this is the the same exact glaze as the piece that we looked at before just now um the so, I mean, that, that's one of the things I love about glazes and glaze chemistry and ceramics. It's, you know, it constantly keeps you on your toes. You always have to learn new things. Um, so this one, this person, uh, when this piece came out of the kiln um, the first time, I thought, oh, really? That's not what I was expecting. And, you know, I was really disappointed. And I even thought about, okay, well, this is definitely gone in trash. Um, and then a little voice in me said, oh, keep it. <laughs> so I decided to, you know, sometimes I do that. Uh, sometimes when, if I don't like a piece immediately, I say, okay, well, I'll just live with it for a while, put it aside. And then, you know, just sort of like look at it with the, you know, with the corner of my eye as I pass it, you know, in the studio and see if it grows on me. And in a few days, this, this piece started to grow on me. And, and then I actually ended up loving it because the, 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 the middle is like a little heart and it's, 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 it's a deep, rich, you know, tropical jungle green, like emerald green, but it's also a crackle. And so I decided to keep it. I'm really glad because it gave me the, the you know, the jumping point to, to experiment with bigger pieces and different pieces. And then I realized um, I actually really quite love this glaze. So this, the, the green is happening simply because of the underlining um, underglaze. Uh, when to, if you put um, the, that blue glaze, the one that we were looking at in the, in the uh, preceding slide, this one, if because I tried this on the black porcelain, knowing it won't look the same, but I was just open to seeing what it will look like, and you couldn't really tell the blue. It just ended up being um, a glossy crackle. So then I decided, okay, I'm going to put a white liner, and then put the glaze on top of that, and then I got this incredibly beautiful um amazon green emerald crackle glaze it's just it's it's i it's so so nice i want to jump in there <laughs> when i see this glaze. and the next one is actually not a ceramic yeah but... I, I collect images of nature because it's 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 always where i draw inspiration from um i i love tropical beaches sand um earthy you know cracked earth pictures um different you know different different bodies of water whether it's you know whether it's cold iceberg you know or um the sky and you know or even dew i love dew pictures um and then i started getting into these um blue holes in different places the bahamas and belize and I, I i look at these images once in a while you know whether it's once a week or once a month or sometimes every day if i'm trying to <laughs> channel um, different glazes and let them sort of like distill in my mind and then trickle into the glaze formula. So I think the green glaze is simply, you know, because I was looking at this picture a lot, um, it just came. <laughs> and then produce the next piece that we'll look at. Mm. Yeah. Not quite, but nonetheless, it gives that same notion of this um, e explosion in the center and then the residue of it creating a wonderful um, embrace of it. Bob, do you want to speak briefly about this? Uh, uh, yes, it looks like something out of the heavens, for example. A, um, 
uh, a white dwarf star exploding or something like that. It's an absolutely beautiful piece. And to realize that it's the same glaze throughout, uh, that uh, depending on the thickness and depending on how uh, uh, components within the glaze uh, migrate to different places as uh, the glaze melts uh, during firing. It's just wonderful to see how the same basic formula can can uh, produce such varied effects uh, in the uh, heat and atmosphere of the kiln. Yeah. Um, I do have one question for EPEC and then would love to hear her comments on this. Now, the, this obviously has a white liner. Uh, it's mm -hmm. black porcelain and you have coated the interior with the white liner. Uh, the glaze would look very different against a black uh, porcelain background, uh, maybe even different colors, I don't know, but it would look very different if the white liner weren't there. I would just like to know, what is the white liner? Is it simply a white slip uh, that you apply to the interior of the vessel, let it dry completely, and then um, apply the glaze? It, it's, a, it's a white slip, is that right? It's it's actually an underglaze, so it you know it, um so oh it's underglaze, an underglaze yeah, as it's more to than a slip. A, yeah it's more than a slip it's supposed to it's supposed to really stick to it so actually I um what I do is I make the piece let it dry biscuit sand it and then I apply the underglaze um I spray it actually so that it's nice and uniform and then clean it and then it biscuit again so the these piece the black ones are bisque twice because I I actually tried um putting the underglaze on before the bisque. But then um, the piece is actually quite brittle, not only brittle, but the underglaze sticks to the black. And you know, if I because I try to have contrast, I end up sponging, wet sponging the piece on the outside, but it only smears the white. So then I figured out it's actually better to bisque the piece, make it harder, and then easier to clean. Then apply the after the bisque fire, apply the underglaze, clean it with a wet sponge, really clean it if I need to sand it, and then bisque it and then glaze it. Just, you know, I figured out that's um, actually the best way, but it's more than just a um, white slip. Right, and so the white underglaze is actually white and it is um, opaque or is yeah, it very opaque. Uh, translucent? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's completely opaque, yeah. It's completely opaque, yeah. yeah. It would yeah. have to be to get the right uh, background so that the interior of the pot can serve as a canvas for your glaze, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. Yeah, what's interesting though, it's um, again, like going back to the whole, the mystery of glazes, and I have a you know tiny little note on this. The Turkish word for um, for glaze is actually the same word for mystery or secret. And it's, I think it's absolutely lovely because you really don't know what you're gonna get and glazes are very mysterious. Um, so even though this is a blue glaze, uh, blue crackle glaze on the, on the white porcelain, it becomes this emerald green on the black one with the white liner. Not only that, but if we look at um, another one of my um, black pieces, um, black porcelain pieces with the white crackle glaze, only white, that one doesn't doesn't have this variation of like the black and you know these sort of waves or foresty look. Interestingly, this glaze pulls parts of that underglaze so that you know in parts you see the the the, the black porcelain comes through, and in parts there is a bit of um, it's absolutely wild. I really I can't explain why it does this. But this glaze pulls parts of the um, the white underglaze and you know causing the the black porcelain to show through the glaze. It's just really interesting. It's also important for people if you did or if did not, we'll send you the e catalog to note the scale of this. So this is twelve inches. Some of the other pieces that we have looked at are more like four, six, and eight inches. So the scale of this is also impressive in person. Then I invite you to see, and we're going to look at the last slide. Um, and this is a considerably yeah, smaller piece, four and three quarter inches. But again, the issue of scale, of weight, of form, and obviously of glaze are all relevant to the care with which you've made them, but also the care with which others are invited to see them. So just talk briefly about both of these, both you, Epec, and then Bob. So with this piece, um... Yeah, I was just looking at the, the glaze recipe here. Yeah, it's this is a, you know, mainly potash, feldspar, some spodgerine and strontium. Strontium is, you know, it does make beautiful blues. And a little bit, of course, copper cabinet, my favorite. Um, and on the inside, so it's rare for me actually to glaze the inside and outside. But for some reason with this, um, with this piece, 
I felt like, okay, I need to glaze also the inside and do something a little bit different there because the black porcelain, when you fire it high, it can look a little bit brown. Not, and I really wanted a good contrast between the, the glaze on the outside and the, the interior. So, uh, because the glaze on the outside, again, has that white underglaze to, to really make it um, um, pop. And, and the inside glaze is actually 20% of you know, one glaze, one, one of my favorite blue shimmery blues and 80% of my bronze glaze. So uh, apart from you know, trying new formulas, I also like to try different proportions of my regular glazes just to see if I can increase the repertoire simply by combining glazes. So the inside is, this, um, is a combination of my bronze and a shimmery blue, which becomes actually a shimmery black. Um, yeah, and I, I love the outside where it's, um, it looks like tiny, teeny little craters like the surface of the moon. The, the, the form is inspired by actually um, copper cauldrons um, that they used to use in the 1800s um, in Ottoman Empire. You know, they, they would have these huge cauldrons where they would serve food or they would use, either um, used to cook food in or serve from. Um, yeah, I just thought it would be a nice variation, you know, to my bowl shape. And Bob, please. Yes, I think it's a wonderful piece. The shape uh, is um, uh, uh, robust, if you will, and uh, uh, it emanates energy. Uh, and also a very beautiful glaze, both the dark glaze on the interior and the beautiful uh, pale blue glaze on the exterior. I was going to ask, but you've already explained about the interior, because as soon as I saw it, I thought black porcelain would not have a luster. Uh, so my first reaction was, apart from the beauty of the piece, was that you must have glazed uh, the interior. And you've answered the question that it has uh, uh, <clears throat> sort of a, a pale blue glaze plus uh, uh, iron, as in the, the brown glazes. Um, and so you've answered that question. It's a very effective uh, combination. And you're right that with the glazed exterior, it's nice to have a bit of glaze on the interior. So there's a slight bit of luster rather than just matte uh, black. Now, uh, the underside of the piece, uh, we only see down to the edge, but not where it um, uh, constricts. Um, uh, I assume that when we move below the uh, lower edge of the blue glaze here, it is unglazed black porcelain is that yes. correct yes yeah. yeah yeah so it goes like this and then there's actually a, a roundish bottom again no foot ring uh and it's right. yeah and because it's uh unglazed uh you don't have to worry about firing supports or anything yeah. like that it can simply yeah. sit on the kiln furniture yeah. yes yeah, yeah the, the, though with porcelain you you end up with something called plucking uh porcelain tends to fuse to the the glazed shelf um i mean the, the kiln shelf Right. Unless it's some um, alumina or sand, so with pe with porcelain, especially also with stoneware people, but with porcelain, I have to put some alumina or kiln wash, something that will ever, ever so slightly um, prevent contact, full contact with the kiln shelf, because I've had pieces actually get stuck on the kiln shelf, and when I would you know um, lift them, it would they would chip a little bit, leaving a part of the pot on the kiln shelf. And when you say uh, aluminum, something like that. Do you mean something as thin as aluminum foil, or do you mean a little tiny oh, aluminum no. um, stand? Alumina, or... yeah. alumina is a very high um, re refractory material that can withstand very high temperatures. So uh, alumina powder is basically... Oh, so you uh, put it on as a powder. Yes, yeah. that makes complete uh, yeah. sense. And talking about the firing this and that, I could see in the background of the little video uh, that we showed at the beginning of your talk, uh, that there is a cylindrical electric kiln uh, in your studio. I presume you fire all of these uh, in an electric kiln. Uh, uh, in a studio setting in a city, yep. of course, uh, you couldn't use a wood-fired kiln, obviously, and gas firing can be somewhat dangerous. So uh, an electric kiln is, is very uh, practical from that fire prevention point of view. At the same time, uh, with the electric kiln, uh, I think you probably have uh, the best uh, facilities for for controlling the temperature, the firing temperature, and the kiln atmosphere. Uh, is that right? So for many reasons, I can guess that you use an electric kiln. Um, yes. So I have two electric kilns, um, a 60-liter one and a 180-liter one. And um, 
there are pros and cons. I mean, I actually started firing. I, I, my love of ceramics started one at Rizzi and then eventually also when I had um, first started working in, in a private studio, it was, we had an, um, a gas firing kiln, but because I make large pieces and because it's porcelain, it means I have to go up very slowly. I have to go down very slowly. Yes. And that, that basically means sometimes the firings are three, four days. And so, so basically when I was working with the gas kiln, that meant I had to be up two, three days, at least four days sometimes, you know, going and, you know, changing because it was not an automatic kiln, which meant I had to change the, uh, you know, the gas, the amount of gas so that I could increase the temperature of the kiln and then eventually lower it by hand. It's after doing this, you know, for two years, you know, about every, like, let's say six months, because it was a big kiln, I, I realized I, I can't, I just can't. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's very taxing on the body. It's, I mean, ceramics generally is hard work if you're working with, you know, large pieces. Um, mm -hmm. the, um, and the largest piece I've ever made was actually 40 kilos, which is more than 80, I think about probably about 90 pounds of clay. That's very taxing on the body also. So I figured something's got to give. I can't be using my body like that, you know, abusing it almost, you know, to make pieces that big. And then on top of that, you know, stay sleepless for, you know, days and days and days. So it was simply a practical decision to, you know, use my energy and time more economically. With, uh, with an wow. electric kiln, it's, it's, it's a couple of things. You can, they, they come with controllers and gas kilns do too, but they, they cost a lot more. Um, so with electric kilns, you can control it. And I have a very good controller. So it means it's got like, you know, 10, 20 steps, uh, which means I can really, you know, um, map out the, the way up and then the ramp, you know, and the way down, the cooling, the, the dwelling, everything. With, with a gas kiln, you have to do that all manually. And I thought, same thing with, um, in the beginning, it felt like, oh, electric kiln is cheating. <laughs> being a purist but eventually I just decided to get over myself same thing as using in pigments it was a difficult decision because I'm so so much of a purist that I thought oh I only have to work with materials that come as they are from the earth and are you know minimally refined so only copper or manganese or you know iron for example but eventually I realized wait a minute <laughs> I'm an artist and I should be able to be more free you know just you know so, so then I thought, okay, I'm allowed, I'm an artist, I'm allowed to work with, you know, pigments that are manufactured. Um, and the whole electric kiln decision also was a, an extension of that eventually. I realized, okay, I need to make my life a little bit easier, you know, because it's difficult enough. And electric kilns are just so much easier to work with. You don't have to stay sleepless for, you know, for weeks every year. They're, they're wonderful for that. So let me, and of course, uh, with your very thick walled pieces, you have to increase the temperature slowly. You have to uh, cool the pieces slowly. Uh, so you need uh, less they crack, split, warp, or something worse. Yeah. Uh, so you need a very, very good control over the kiln. And yeah. I would just have one last question, probably pretty quick. Do you fire most of your pieces one by one in the kiln, or do you fire multiple pieces in the kiln? Always multiples. I mean, it's yeah, to save time so. and energy. Efficient yeah. use of time and yeah. energy. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 mainly you know saving energy and um, you know, being more efficient you know financially and energy wise. And also sure. the kilns are big enough. Um, even I, mean, I can't fire my bigger pieces in my small kiln, the sixty liter one. But I can fire. I mean, on a shelf, any given shelf, I actually a lot of times with the big ones, I can only fit one in the bigger kiln. So every shelf, most of the time, when I work with big pieces, has one piece. Um, mm -hmm. But the, I can do, like, I think when I was working for the show, the, mm, the most amount of pieces I could fit when I was working with big ones was three or four pieces in the kiln. So even though it's multiples, it's still a um, very small amount of pieces I can fit inside my kilns. One day I'd like to have a bigger studio with a bigger kiln, but at the moment, you know, I do what I can with what I have. So sure. that's, that means, you know, three to four big pieces in a kiln, in a firing. So let me conclude. Um, first of all, you talked about the efficiency in time and uh, a small apology to all who thought they were tuning in for an hour and they got much more for which I'm very grateful. Um, a lot of very good and meaningful information and also a good deal of appreciation and hopefully guides as to how more carefully to look at 
your work, EPEC, but also to look at art in general. The vast majority of artists that we work with do invest totally of themselves and what they're creating. And it's always rewarding for the work itself to be appreciated by people looking carefully and hopefully this conversation will help with that. And finally, I just wanna add, a, as I usually do a quote from Thomas that says, skill and art are not the same thing. And the only real measure of art is astonishment. And I think that's a nice way to think about people who see your work. And Bob certainly has done that beautifully to feel astonished and grateful for what you've created. So thank you everyone, Carolyn, thank you so much. And look forward to seeing everybody in person again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.